I'm going to start now. Uh, my name is Suad Ali, and uh, I'm not actually from the borough, uh, but this borough means a lot to a lot of people who aren't from the borough, who hope for you know the post-labour politics of awesomeness. Um, we're here to a couple of days before uh, a general election, and uh, we want to discuss what's at stake here. There has just been a unprecedented coup and there's a lot of uh, ill feeling in the air and how can we um, maneuver around that to get some good results um, uh, perhaps an amazing result on Thursday uh, perhaps some new relationships uh, post um, to Hamlet's first post labor um, and we've got a candidate here who you all probably know better than I do um, Dr. Glyn Robbins, who's a housing expert and uh, activist, and just wanted him to speak maybe for about half an hour on issues of housing in this area and how different levels of government can impact that from local authority to the, the bigger national debate. Um, we have an incumbent who, whose record we can interrogate but who looks likely to um, sail through on Thursday. And there are probably some things we can do to prevent that, or at least soften the blow. The Labour PPC's silence stroke complicity in, in the coup would be something to unpack. Um, so, yeah, to do half an hour speaking, and uh, we'll go to um, question and answers after that. Shall we swap to our you could just... I mean, I will use the mic just because of the acoustics. Could, can people hear me all right? Yeah. Um, we'd probably be grateful to know I'm not going to speak for half an hour, sorry for it. Um, even I can't speak about housing for that long. But I want to thank Fred for, for organising tonight. I mean, obviously it's a bank holiday, um, certainly from the point of view of our campaign. I sense the beginnings of a certain amount of weariness and I'm hoping that tonight we can go away and find um, the second wind that we're going to need in order to get the kind of result that we need on Thursday. Um, and as I say, given, given that and, and um, the type of meeting we have, I don't propose to make a long political speech. But there are some important things, as Fred says, that I think we need to discuss, and maybe tonight is as good a night as any to, uh, to talk about them. Um, just in case people are not aware of it, though, I should probably mention to you that this, used, this building used to be known as the Selfridges of the East End. This was Wickham's apart, department store, and uh, certainly my family and other families in the area would, would have seen this as the kind of equivalent that you have in a lot of, of towns of that signature department store that sort of predates the Tesco Tescofication of London and the UK. So that's what this building was. And, and I might come into this a little bit in what I say, because my other association with this building, apart from what happened last Thursday, which is which obviously something that I do want to talk about, was that this was also, yeah, there was a, a small the office of in this very big building where, I guess it must have been um, 10, 15 years ago maybe, the Socialist Alliance used to be based, and some people are looking at each other thinking, well, no, we have one of them. The Socialist Alliance actually was a kind of precursor to, to respect, and I suppose it's part of the, the lineage that has, to some degree, led, led us to, as Fuad says, to consider the question of, you know, a post-New Labour Tower Hamlets, and for my money anyway, post-New Labour Britain. So, I mean, last Thursday obviously is a good place to start. Last time I was in this building, uh, there were a few more people here then. And I'm sure, I'm guessing most of you were also here and, and you can say what you thought about it. I mean, my impression, my feeling obviously was, was the sense of excitement, but, but also a real anger, a real bitterness and resentment that borough has been subject to this attack and 
I mean, obviously different people and possibly even people within this room will have different views about how we came to this. But I do think it's now got to a point where it is much more significant and important than the guilt or innocence of one politician. In the sense that, I can't remember, I think you probably have to go back to the Liverpool and Lambeth days in the early 80s, when the national government effectively imposed direct rule from Westminster over a local authority, essentially because it had political disagreements with that local authority. And I think for the remaining three days, but it's going to take a lot longer than that of this campaign, we need to try and tap into that anger and articulate the the wider political implications of what happened in court last Thursday week. And, and certainly, as, as Phil has also said, you know, we need to be making our voice heard on that question because it's certainly not something that you're going to hear from the other parties, uh, and particularly you're not going to hear it from New Labour, who's, I think most people recognise, whose who's fingerprints are all over this and have been the architects of this assault on Lutfer in particular, but really on, well, essentially on, on the political will of 37,395 people. And that's something that we, we need to challenge very firmly. And I am getting a sense, and obviously these things are always very impressionistic and a bit subjective, but we are doing a lot of work in this campaign. We are talking to a lot of people. We are gathering momentum and support constantly. Now, you know, I don't want to overstate it, I don't want to build up unrealistic expectations, but I think partly because of what we collectively have done over the years at the left in town, that's I suppose to some degree because of what I personally have done, but, but I think more specifically because of the fact that we have been prepared to to take a clear position on the uh, the election court case. I do think that we are going to see a uh, significant, I'm going to put it more strongly than that, a significant uh, vote for us on, on Thursday. But obviously, you know, one of the joys, I guess, of bourgeois democracy is that it does have an end point and you do know what the result is uh, most of the time, unless, of course, the, uh, the law steps in. Um, but, you know, I think, I think we are seeing a shift. And obviously that shift needs to continue after Thursday because we have the election, the rerun mayoral election on the 11th of June and certainly I feel quite strongly um, and, and published in material that we've been out in the last few days reflects this, that uh, the selection of, of Rabina Khan is, is the politically correct one for this particular moment in time and that's that we need to uh, support Rabina, not uncritically, but we need to be calling for a vote for, for Rabina on the 11th of June. Um, and I feel that any other conclusion really would be to endanger a lot of the reforging of, of links that we've managed to achieve over the last few weeks. And when we started on this, I had three objectives really. Um, the first, the first one was to, to try to take a step, at least in town, that's towards uniting the left. I guess this alludes back to my comment about the Socialist Alliance at the beginning. Um, you know, again, I'm sure people in this room, as long as I've been around, probably have, have, have had more experience of the many different incarnations of the, of the left over the years. Um, and I suppose the question of, of how we reformulate progressive left-wing politics is, to my mind anyway, is the key question for, well, for the, I, I think about it in these sort of slightly fatalistic terms, I guess, but the key question for my, the remainder of my political and indeed biological life uh, is, is really where do we go from here in terms of building a robust and sustainable alternative to New Labour. And that is a question which is, is still moot, is one that has to be 
discussed, but I, I would say not discussed uh, at our leisure, because I think there's been too much of that in the past, as well as too much, let's um, call it infighting or sectarianism or, or spending more time looking inwards instead of outwards. Um, but also there is an urgency now, because again, without wishing to labour the point of view, um, don't need to have it laboured to. And I think who had talked about it, the title for tonight was, you know, what's at stake? Well, as far as I'm concerned, what's at stake really is, uh, is the welfare state, essentially. And I do believe, and I, I hope I'm not sort of shout waving now, but I do believe that unless we develop this kind of serious left alternative to the neoliberal orthodoxy in this country, in 20 years' time, all of the things that we have held dear in Britain and, and the achievements of both our generation and the generations before us in terms of the NHS, in terms of council housing and in terms of any kind of sense of public provision and public services will be gone. And to that extent I think you know the, the stakes couldn't be any higher and I know what happens here in the next few days is only a very minor part but I think taking the first step on that road uh, is essential and, and so I'm delighted to say that of those three objectives I set, I feel already that we've achieved the first one because during the course of the campaign we've had the involvement of, I can't, I'm not going to try to list them now so I'm getting a bit addled about names in general, <laughs> names of people, never mind names of organisations, but I think you know half a dozen different left organisations have been actively involved in the campaign so far, as well as numbers of people who aren't involved in any uh, left organisation and that's, that's really important. Uh, and I suppose I should mention alongside which we've had the, um, the active and also um, subterranean support of elements within town as first as well. Uh, so several of the councillors have come out publicly to support us and me. Several of the others are, I'm led to believe, although I don't necessarily uh, you know, bank on this, acting uh, in order to try and maximise our vote on Thursday. And I, and I think, again, this is very important and significant. And I suppose, in a way, it reflects back to some of the issues that developed around the, the respect period and the aftermath of it, which, again, I think other people perhaps will want to talk about. But as I said, I think, generally speaking, I'm really pleased, even if the election happened tomorrow and we got wiped out, I'd be pleased that we um, have have managed to, to bring people together again and bring people who haven't been involved for some time back and find some new people as well. And, and that's, that's really been good. And I think, uh, I think if we do well on Thursday, then this will be a lesson. The second thing that I set out as, as a goal was, uh, was to establish <coughs> the framework or the groundwork for, for an alternative kind of politics, not in terms of reinventing the I mean, I don't see myself as some kind of latter-day uh, Keir Hardy or whatever, but, you know, to try to begin the process of suggesting how we can perhaps do politics in a slightly different way, but without necessarily jettisoning or compromising on, on some of the core beliefs or values of the left, and so I think it's been really important. In fact, funny enough, someone said to me earlier today we was leafleting uh, outside a, a masjid near near where I live on Roman Road, and somebody said to me, "What do you think is a problem that you, that you've got socialist under your name so on, on the tabloid that says Green Robbins, the socialist candidate?" And I actually think it's really important that that is there, and and I really I, I believe it's essential that we don't retreat from that sense of our of, of identity that, that we are socialists, we are trade unionists, and we've got nothing to be apologetic about for, that, for those things. And actually I think we make a common mistake if we underestimate the sense in which people who may not share our, our cultural or political traditions and, and heritage may also identify themselves in the same way. Or at least have a sense of a sympathy with the left. And we've certainly picked this up a little bit in talking to people over the last few weeks. Um, you know, without wanting to over, over simplify or stereotype people coming out of, of prayers at the mosque and saying, oh, well, I'm a socialist, or, you know, my family back in Bangladesh, they aligned themselves to the left. You know, we, we need to, 
then there's a sort of philosophical, theological aspect to this as well, because I've been talking quite a lot to, to Muslims, and to state the obvious, I'm not a Muslim, and indeed I'm an atheist, but talking to people who are Muslims and seeing the common ground in terms of the beliefs of, of Islam and the beliefs of socialists, I think, is a, is a, is a place that we need to be prepared to go, in, in, certainly in town. It's, I mean, it may not be quite as, you may not get quite the same echo for some of this stuff in other places, but I think here and other places, and particularly, obviously, with the spectre of Islamophobia haunting us, and not so much me, but for <laughs> and other people who, who are Muslims. You know, it, we need to start to think about what those commonalities are and, and feel that we, you know, we don't need to be challenged by uh, the sense that we might lose something of our individual ideologies, that we can see some common ground there. Um, one of my abiding memories, actually, of, and, and things that I learned most about respect for all of the things that didn't quite work out the way I'd hoped they would. Uh, people might remember this kind of 80% principle whereby we talk about and we focus on, we campaign around the 80% of things that we agree with. Um, not that we ignore the other 20%, um, although there's an argument that we, we perhaps did do that within respect, and people have different views. But the, the really, and particularly given the challenge that we face, you know, we really need to think and talk about and act on the 80% rather than obsess about the 20%. So again, I think we're beginning to do that. I mean, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating on, on Thursday to, to a degree. But I think we have set out some ground uh, where we can begin to move a campaign in a more progressive uh, direction in town. A, I'd like to think that that would be reflected in Rabina Khan's candidacy, although you know, I don't think that's something we can take for granted either. Um, and just while it's in my mind, I mean, I think one of the lessons that I would hope that um, the town is first are learning at the moment is, is what happens if you build on too that narrow a base. And if you think about building on too narrow a base, well, what happens is it becomes very easy to be pushed over. And although I'm not saying that's what's happened to town at first, I think you know, it's imperative that after Thursday and into the 11th of June and beyond, you know, we, we try and build on a much wider and, and more solid, therefore, uh, base. And then the third thing that, that I said as an objective was really just to challenge New Labour, to, to give them a hard time, to maybe give them a few restless nights, um, and remind them, although they seem to constantly need to be reminded of this, quite understand why this is, that they cannot, should not and cannot take for granted their hegemony in, in a place like town, and so we cannot assume um, that, that people would always vote for them. And, and although there's plenty of evidence to prove that, they seem to still be wedded to that fantasy for, for some reason. Um, and to the extent that I'm fairly sure Incidentally, that if people are thinking about what they may or may not do for the next three days, I'm fairly sure the Labour have stopped campaigning. Um, I think they think they've got this one and that they don't need to try anymore. And I really urge people to spend as much time as you possibly can between now and Thursday creating a situation in which they live to regret that. Because it is an arrogance. And it is again repeating the mistakes of the past in terms of taking for granted the people of the borough. But I mean, you know, this is only one place, and I, I, I suppose the key thing is what's happened to the Labour Party at a national level. Again, I don't think I probably need to spell this out in this particular forum, but you know, I, I always think of it in my own sort of personal terms, really, as someone who joined the party when I was 16 who was brought up within what I think of as the traditional. Labour movement and has sort of loyally to some degree and dumbly to some degree voted Labour for, for most of my life. And I can't quite remember the point at which and other people who live with me may want to remind me that even until comparatively recently I was still thinking, no, you know, there might still be a chance. They might be able to, uh, you know, if we 
push in the right direction if we maybe if we all rejoin. I don't know. I mean, I personally <coughs> have all kinds of convoluted arguments for why perhaps uh, we can recover, rescue the Labour Party from its um, from its destructive, self-destructive destiny. And, and I suppose I haven't done what I've done for the last few weeks. I suppose I've now gone past that, and I think that really. But the last thing I want to say essentially is, you know, we the urgent task is is to build an alternative. Uh, I don't think we're going to recover the Labour Party from where it is. I think the Labour Party, if anything, is going to get worse. I think we have to talk about the role of the trade unions within Labour. Although I've mentioned in passing, as a Unite member myself, I was delighted. I mean, I have to say, surprised as well. Absolutely delighted that. Uh, that Unite have come out very publicly in support of Blue for Arm, and it's absolutely the right position. And, and I was, it was great to see Andrew Murray saying that so clearly last Thursday. But that doesn't negate the wider question of the wider trade union movement, and not, and not the least of which is the role of Unite itself um, in terms of what may or may not happen after Thursday. So I'm going to shut up. I know Fred might want to talk a bit about housing, which I'm always prepared to do. Um, I think we, you know, there's used this opportunity to talk about some of these things, but I, I, I suppose I do really want to encourage people to use what time is left. Everything that we do from now until 10 o'clock on Thursday is going to matter. You know, somebody said to me at the weekend, you know, not, not like some of the other campaigns you might have been involved with where you think, oh, well, I'm just going through the motions and, you know, every text message, every email, every appearance on Facebook, Twitter and all the other technologies that I don't understand. But more importantly, you know, talking to people face to face, which I've been trying to do these last few days, it is going to it is going to help. You know, this is not in vain, and I think if we can find that second win and really work through till the end of, of, of ten o'clock on Thursday, and then we can we'll see what the result is. But it will not have been it will not have been in vain. And, and actually, while I'm at it, to just finally say thank you to everybody here in this room and elsewhere who have contributed massively to what we've done. I mean, I think we almost underestimated it, but not that long ago there were, um, there were 30,000 of those tabloids in Jackie Turner's hall. You barely get into a hall, you know, into a house. We're now down to the last two or three packets, that is. So there's been a huge effort and we've covered an awful lot of ground and, and it won't be wasted. Thanks. Um, please, um, if you've got questions, just uh, shout them out and we'll bring some other themes uh, as we go along. In the absence of any hands, uh, I would like to ask uh, how far could they go in, uh, let's call it the Labour Reconquista, to social events, to Well. <coughs> What we're about alluding to really is the use of housing policy to effect an act of, of social engineering, social cleansing. Some people talk about it in terms of ethnic cleansing, other people refer to gentrification. There are numbers of different <coughs> labels that are applied to housing policy, both in this borough but everywhere. You know, this is a this is a global phenomenon that I don't think anyone here at least has any illusions about this because of housing being perceived primarily as a, as a vehicle for individualism and, and speculation, financial speculation, um, you can see very similar dynamics to the ones that we see in town. It's in almost any city in this country, in almost any city in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at Lena here who, who lives on uh, the British Street, or near to the British Street estate, which is just down the road in my land. It so happens to be uh, one of the states that I used for my PhD research where, you know, I really did come face to face with the thinking, the ideology that is creating the situation that we talk about rhetorically, i.e. local people, whatever we mean by that, and that's a slightly loaded term, um, cannot afford to live in this borough anymore and are being progressively forced out, incrementally moved to 
from the suburbs to Newham to Redbridge and beyond. Now, I mean, there's a danger of oversimplifying this, and I think we need to be aware that there are push as well as there are pull as well as push factors in that. Um, you know, my own family moved from the east end to the suburbs, and they went because they wanted to go. Um, although I should say, that some, to some extent, they regretted it. Um, but you know, there are still people who, who would rather live in uh, Ganshill than my end. Um, but. There is no question that there's a deliberate policy of foot. It's been going on for, well, basically, you can certainly trace it back to 97 in the election of New Labour, whereby the, the language of so-called mixed communities has been used to justify a housing policy that is heavily skewed towards money, that is heavily skewed towards private property developers, and which provides housing, sometimes under the guise and camouflage of affordability and affordable social housing, that is really nothing of a kind as far as a significant proportion of the local community's concerned, and that's what I found down at British Street, where I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but um, you know, of, of 100, 176 plus new buildings, new homes that were created, built down there, I think less than 20% were defined in any way as affordable, and often that is a misleading and, and in fact meaningless term. So, you know, for British Street, multiplied by practically every borough that's been subject to uh, estate, subject to regeneration in this borough and others in London, and there are people in the room who are far more void, versed in this than I am. Um, so, it is a form, in my mind anyway, of social cleansing. I think the clear political motivation for that was articulated by Robin Wells back in Wales, who's the, the mayor of Newham. Back in, um, I guess it was the late 90s, and I've got the reference somewhere at home, but he said, we don't want any more social housing in this borough. He was quite explicit about it. And part of the reason for that is that they don't want people who they perceive as potentially being a drain on the public purse, people who might be more dependent on <coughs> benefits, might be more dependent on a range of public services, they would far, far rather have wealthy people who are going to pay more in council tax and make less of a, a call on the local and national state. It's not just about economics though, there's a strong ideological component to this. And uh, when I interviewed some people uh, on the British estate, the developers especially, you know, they were really not very subtle in their sense that there was something wrong with British Street and there's something wrong with the people who live there. And so you get references in my research, which I shouldn't be quoting, but I've got my PhD now, so I don't. Um, you know, we used to have a shop here that used to sell some out of date milk and the odd bottle of blue nun wine. You know, this kind of demeaning language about local people. Uh, we knew that one of the shops was being used for a prayer room and we had to do something about that we would think that we'd arrived if Starbucks came to the British Street Estate. This, this is the kind of thinking that, that, that <coughs> has informed housing policy and, and planning policy more generally for the last 15 years, and we've got to change it. So again, I think what we do between now and Thursday you know, can only have a minor role, but we, the fact that we've said housing is our number one critical <coughs> issue, our campaign issue is, is important. And how, if the result is as good as it possibly could be on Thursday, you know, it's not going to be enough to change some of this stuff. We need to start addressing it uh, and attacking it in, in, a, in a much wider forum than Beth McGreen and Bo. I'm getting a bit sick of the sound of my own voice. Is anyone else going to? Please. Thank you. When the state wants to purchase um, housing in order to get renewable, uh, get energy, for example, from the ground, or oil, for example, in other in other places in the UK, or fracking, for example, they'll just um, compulsory purchase order mm. um, some land, and they'll pay the price that they want to pay. Now, I wonder if the if we could identify a landowner that owns a lot of property in the Tower Hamlets that's not being used. Um, you could target them personally and say the state can intervene here, the state can possibly purchase um, this land 
at the price it seeks to pay because it's a necessary, you know, it's necessary for it to be purchased because you're not using it. Um, so that means that property developers have kept a lot of property can be isolated that way. I don't know if you're example. Well, as in most places, actually, the main landowner that you're alluding to is us. You know, there's a significant, I mean, there was a lot more, and we have, you know, sold, to use the cliche, we have sold off the, the family silver in town and so elsewhere. But there are still significant tracts of publicly owned land in this borough. The last time I checked, there is a register, I advise people to, to check this, it's uh, the HCA, which controls housing associations and other aspects of development, keeps a register of undeveloped public land. And the last time I checked, it was over 100,000 acres in the country. That's a lot. You could build a lot of housing on that land, and it's our land. So to cite two very clear examples in the borough right now, and the places that I think we need to go to and start to challenge in the way that you've just described, is the London Chest Hospital in Bethnal Green, which is, is part of the National Health Service estate, but I think it's now run by um, Health for England, uh, which is, is in the process of being mothballed, and you can bet your life, if we don't have a campaign to stop it, will be sold off as private luxury housing. It's crying out for it. But that's our land. We built that hospital. Well, actually, it was charity, but it's received, you know, over the years, how many millions of pounds of public money to invest in that site. And we will see it sold off uh, unless we do something to stop it. A bigger example and a more threatening one, I think, in terms of the overall character of the borough is the Bishopsgate Goodyard site, which is the one that sort of straddles Bethlehem Green Road and um, Commercial Street. It's a huge site, I can't remember the exact acreage. In fact, I'm doing this, a hustings tomorrow night in uh, Toynbee Hall at 7, so I better find out what the facts and figures are by then. Um, I'm just going to focus on Bishopsgate. But it's a massive site, and again, it's public land, essentially. It was owned by Railtrack, or is owned by Railtrack, I believe. So, you know, we, we own that land, and, and what we, are, we being people associated with a campaign I've been associated with for many years, Defend Council Housing, have always said is if it's public land, it should be public housing. And it's as simple as that. And, you know, we don't want 30%, 40%, 50%, all of these various often euphemistic and misleading targets. We want 100%. Now, as I said at a meeting the other day, maybe 100% council housing on the Bishopsgate Goods Yard site might make the town. It starts to look a little bit like East Berlin. But, you know, this, these are <clears throat> demands. You know, people get confused between demands and policy, I think. These are demands. If we have 20,000 plus people on the housing register in this borough, and we have big publicly owned development sites that are available then we need to use that land to provide the homes for those 20,000 people. It's as simple as that. Um, so there are, and there are other examples around the borough, and I think we need to be using the mayoral contest in June, again, because Ravina has a background in housing and has made some fairly public comments and statements and commitments around housing. We need more council housing. You know, it doesn't have to all be council housing. I don't think anyone is arguing that, but we will not and cannot solve the housing crisis until we restore council housing to the mainstream of housing policy. And we need to use public land and public resources to do it. And the things that we need to do it are there, but it will not be. But it can be done. You know, they will create these obstacles and, and the sense that nothing, nothing can change and that, you know, that it's inevitable that property developers will control our destiny. But I was mentioning somebody before the meeting to put, you know, there is a danger in constantly looking back in sort of rose tinted glasses to the post war period in this country. But the fact remains that a government recovering from far more social and economic stress than the one we currently have managed to build a million homes in five years, and most of them were council homes. And I think using that example is. It's, it's a way of, of reminding people that we, we don't have to be controlled by our housing policy, we can control it. Did that answer the question or not? Yes. Okay, anybody else? Hello? Yeah, uh, you've been busy.
not a question, just to say uh, a few words. I specifically actually came uh, for the this one. Um, the acoustic trip, it doesn't. No, it's, we can, we can, it's fine. I think they can be. Um, I, I actually just came to say a few words rather than uh, ask, ask questions. I think I know where uh, Glynis stands when it comes to some of the policies that people are asking questions of. Uh, this morning I actually spoke and endorsed uh, George Galloway uh, in Bradford West and he spoke to them via telephone. Um, and one thing I said that reason me being in politics, people like him and Glenn and others actually gave me birth uh, to politics. I am who I am today because of their contribution. And I think one thing that someone like me never forgets their grassroots and where has they come from. I sent a text message to somebody a while back to a comrade uh, saying that I want to go back to the grassroots where I come from. Although you know I I am the deputy mayor and I enjoy that role, but it's not the same as being on the grassroots and attending a meeting like this, a smaller meeting. You know I don't want to just attend and speak and rush off to next uh, event. And um, I endorsed uh, Glenn officially uh, a few a few days ago. Um, and calling on all my supporters and all my friends and families to vote uh, for him. And there is a few issues uh, around this. Um, one, I think we have to be very clear as to what is happening at the moment. You can have somebody from the mainstream uh, political party, and I think this is something that I have learned over the last six, seven years in terms of, um, obviously, when I was elected as a respect councillor, when you have somebody from the mainstream political party, they will only speak what their masters want them to speak. And they will only say what their masters want them to say. This is absolutely fundamental in all of this. The other thing also we have to understand, the community deserves somebody who understands the community, somebody who will listen and be available. Now, i tell you something, the two current prospective candidates that we have, especially Beth Green and Bob, she's not campaigning <coughs> as hard as she can, because she thinks she already got it in the bag and there's no need for her to go out and knock on the doors. When you go and knock on the doors and you talk to people, you appreciate why they are, uh, you are out and people ask you questions just like you have the opportunity to ask one-to-one -one questions with Glenn uh, tonight. And I think this is why it's important for the communities of this borough to send a very clear message on Thursday night uh, uh, that when she realizes, even if she wins, and I say big, big if, if she wins, she does realize that her vote has reduced as support in the community has reduced, and they cannot, they cannot take the community for granted. That's absolutely uh, essential. Uh, for Glenn, um, I think what I will say, I have worked with Glenn for many years now. Uh, I have seen him in action. I have seen him when EDL have tried to enter Tower Hamlets, how he have worked with mosques, church, uh, people of faith and no faith, black and white, and how to mobilize and unite people to make sure that we send a very loud and clear message. Somebody who's got huge background in housing, somebody who has campaigned tirelessly for housing. I remember when I first came a councillor, Ocean State, where people will recall some of the when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, 56 million pounds was given for the regeneration of Ocean State. I've been a councillor now 12 years. I'm yet still to know where has this 56 million pound gone and how that money been spent. But unfortunately, when you come from the establishment uh, background, you don't have to be accountable for uh, anything or what goes wrong. Um, and when Glenn and myself, we fought against this stock transfer and we were successful. And this is why entire Hamlets, Ocean is one of the states, is not, was handed over to as a result of a stock uh, transfer. And where stock transfer has taken place, people are still suffering, whether you go to in uh, Brune House, uh, Holland State, 
uh, people are still suffering. Not long ago, last council election, they voted a petition uh, raising their concerns and their issues. Um, and this is why I think I'm proud to endorse uh, Glenn. I'm proud to support uh, Glenn. He's somebody who is vetted into the community, somebody who understands the community, somebody who will be the championing the issues of community. And I think for me, it's absolutely essential. And I'll say this, you know, if people sitting in this room and outside this room, if they didn't fought racism in this borough, someone like me would not be standing here today. Someone like me would not be living in Dockland when 10, 15 years ago, black and Asian people were too frightened to go into uh, Dockland. When I was seven years old, I used to go on D7 bus into Poplar, uh, Christian Market, there used to be a British guest uh, office there where people used to go and make a payment. And my dad used to go there, he used to go around the Dockland, and my dad always used to say, uh, don't come in this area, it's a dangerous area, it's a nasty area. But it's not long, no longer that the case. It's only because people in this room and outside this room made that contribution. And we are grateful to those people for those making this contribution. But this fight, unfortunately, <coughs> is not over. What we have seen that happen with Lutfu Rama, it shows us that fight is not over. The reason it's not over, and I said this to Lutfu Rama himself, someone like him and people in this room and outside this room gives my five-year-old daughter a hope in life to fight injustice. But unfortunately, there is people out there who wants to take that hope away. They want to take the chance away so that my people like my daughter do not stand up when injustice is taking place. Do not fight when, for their rights and defend their rights and their community's rights. And this is why we need somebody in parliament you know, who will stand up. You can have comrades, 10 sheep, or you can have one tiger. And that's the same thing I said about Galloway. People may disagree in, with Galloway in many things. People may disagree with Glyn on many issues. I don't expect people to agree. I don't think I will agree probably on everything Glyn uh, says. But I'd rather have him than have a puppet of a master in the parliament who will only speak what they say. When Bushnara Ali says, I resign in opposition to Syrian war, she did a deal, we all know that, with Ed Miliband. And she resigned, but she abstained. She didn't even have the courage to vote against it. So it was a kind of people feel, and this is the problem. The people feel, the establishment feel, the people of Tarahamas are so naive and so incompetent when it comes to politics that they will just follow as they are told to follow. That is not the case anymore. People are educated, people are articulate, and they are very much into politics. So I hope the people will come out in their hundreds and thousands on Thursday and vote for Glyn. Um, I will certainly say the step in Greenwood uh, is in my, uh, it's my wood. Uh, I've already spoken to the community leaders and the key stakeholders in that area. They will be certainly voting for Glyn on Thursday. They will certainly get their friends and families to vote uh, for uh, Glenn on Thursday. And I think we have to do all we can in the next two or three days that we have, make sure that we get everybody out. I think the important aspect of it is that this is something that I have learned over the years, is getting the people out on the day to vote for it. And this is what we have to do. On Thursday, Glenn, I'm available. If there is something I can do to help, um, I have a car. If, if you feel that I can be in any way utilized, I'm more than happy uh, to come and support. Uh, and do whatever I can to make sure that you are elected and to make sure that you get into parliament and represent the uh, people's uh, voice of this borough. I'm sorry if I have taken too much of your time, but I wanted to come and relay that message. All my colleagues, all my councillor colleagues, including uh, Rabina Khan, will be uh, voting for Glyn if they live in uh, Bethnal Green and Bowen. If they live in uh, Poplar and Limehouse, uh, I believe they will vote for Hugh in, in Poplar and Limehouse. So it's important that we send that message and we spread the message and we will do between now and Thursday all weekend to make sure that we mobilize people to come out and vote for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. Um, if we think about the birth of the modern Labour Party, two of the absolutely critical areas are Scotland and East London. Uh, and there's no doubt on Thursday we're likely to see a political earthquake in Scotland. The Labour Party, which has been 
the biggest party unbroken since 1959 in Scotland, is likely to be all but wiped out. It may hold on to eight or ten seats perhaps, but it has 41 at the moment. Uh, and the Scottish National Party is likely to win dozens of seats. Why? Because people are enraged that a party that used to claim to stand for the working class he jigged around with the Tories during the independence referendum and has turned its back on genuinely standing up for working people. That's a political earthquake. It will have implications about who forms the next government and so on. Uh, we're not quite at that same scale in East London. Uh, but the tremors are there. Uh, it seems to me that that's one of the crucial reasons why we do have to campaign as hard as possible for Glyn and for Hugo in the run-up uh, to Thursday, and then think what we do afterwards as well, because um, it's true this one ends on Thursday, but the next one's already begun. Uh, and the battles are certainly going to come after Thursday, because if you look at, for example, the no-growth figures that came out a few days ago, they demonstrate that uh, we're not in a period in which the economy is going to massively expand, the cuts and austerity are going to come with a vengeance, whoever gets into number 10 after Thursday. And therefore it's very, very important that the votes that we're winning now are an investment for the future, electorally, organisationally, politically, and in terms of building a broader left. Uh, and I think what you said about building a more united left is incredibly important. Uh, one of the lacks we have is left of Labour, there is not uh, a Syriza, as there was in Greece. There's not a Podemos, as there is in the Spanish state. Uh, instead, there are small groups which are quite disunited. Uh, and we have to do something about that. Uh, you know, we should be modest about what we've achieved. I'm the National Secretary of the Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, we haven't managed to achieve uh, durable credible, big enough left to do it. We have to make sure that we're fighting to do that after Thursday. I think it's great that uh, Left Unity and Tusk, the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, are joining together in Glyn's candidacy. I think we need to build on that afterwards. I think all of us have to address uh, putting aside our own narrow interests and instead think about the bigger interests of the working class and people who want to vote to the left of Labour. No, that means that we stop discussing and arguing. Um, I'll disagree with left unity about some things, I'll disagree with the Socialist Party about some things, but come on, surely we ought to be able to have a unified left electoral challenge uh, at the general election, at council elections in the future, and so on. And in Tower Hamlets, we have to think how we're pioneering that process uh, around the mayoral election, but also let's remember that because disgracefully Alibor Chowdhury was removed, uh, as well as look for Armin, that there will be a council by-election uh, on the 11th of June. I think we have to think about how we can creatively use that by-election to demonstrate a broader left in Tower Hamlets and people working together. I think we have to think about how task left unity, Tower Hamlets first, various groups come together and discuss that sort of options around both those elections. And if we do that, I think there's quite a big constituency for it. Uh, you see the support for Tower Hamlets first, the support for Look for Rahman, that magnificent meeting last Thursday, the fact that Unite did come out so strongly and say that they would support for Look for Rahman, the potential that exists to do it. It's not easy to do it, we know that, and there's plenty of people who will tell us it's impossible, and cynicism is easy. Uh, but actually we have to be better than that, we have to keep trying, we have to keep building, and that begins with getting the biggest possible vote on Thursday, because the bigger the vote, the easier it will be to argue that we can create a stronger, more united, more credible left for the electoral battles, for the social battles, for the battles in the workplace that are to come, and they are going to come. Thanks for that. Um... I want to maybe open the floor to Hugo a bit. So I'm just going to put my hand up. Thank you, Hugo. Do you know uh, about, about your campaign, how it's different with Fitzpatrick, similarities with Roshnara? <coughs> yeah. 
Um, well, one of the things that I think has been really good about the campaign that we've run, and I don't think it's been ex as extensive as the campaign really has had, so I'm not going to pretend that it's been anything otherwise, <coughs> but actually it's the way in which I think we've been re able to reconnect class politics, actually on that side of the borough. Because when you go around and, I mean, we've been campaigning around slogans of £10 now, minimum wage, about building council housing in the borough, and I think they've got a very, very wide response and a very warm response, actually, when we've been campaigning on that. And to, to campaign on issues that affect working class people as a class, I've been very surprised how that's had a unifying message right across um, that particular constituency in Poplar and Limehouse. I've also been quite impressed when we've gone to the Hustings, for example, that yes, the Labour politicians are polished. Um, I've done two or three down in, uh, in the Limehouse area. I've done one, I think, back in Green the other night. Yes, they're polished. Yes, they're briefed. Yes, they've got their notes. But actually their message doesn't go any further than the end of the table that we're sitting at. But what actually tends to happen is the message, the class politics message, tends to really get out in the hustings that we've had. And so when I've gone out after the meeting and said to people, you know, this is what we're standing on, what do you think? People are engaging with us, people are talking to us about our policy on housing, about a policy on uh, rent controls. They're talking to us about our policy on building council housing in this borough as opposed to the luxury apartments. They even want to know, well actually you did mention stuff about where the money's going to come from. We know about the amount of money that's sat there in Canary Wharf and around policies around nationalising the banks. All of those sorts of things, we've raised those as policy issues because after all, this isn't just an election about Tower Hamlets, but it is a place where we can start to raise national issues and I think crucially the issues around socialism and what it means. And I think that that's been really um, a, an important part, feature of the election campaign. I think the other thing that has been good about Tusk in general has been the question of standards and anti-austerity uh, party which I think, again, has really gone down very well. The fact it's an anti-cuts initiative. And I suppose in some senses, that to me is the key of where we're going. Now we've seen everybody jumping on that bandwagon of anti-austerity in the Hustings. The Greens have made a big point about how the, the anti-austerity, how they're an anti-austerity party as well. But actually, I think when you start to look through their policies, it's been quite threadbare when um, you know, people have start to question them and what do they stand for. It has been threadbent and they actually seem to be just another one of the establishment parties. Not so much obviously as Labour, Tories and the others, but they're seen in a similar sort of light. So I think our policy has gone down well and I have to say that the principles, that, and I think this is probably one of the lessons we've got to learn about what's happened Certainly since the Labour Party abandoned Clause 4 and its socialist policies, and possibly even before that, actually, because I was expelled from the Labour Party in 91. But one of the things that we need to, I think, learn the lessons of is that, in a sense, we can make formations, we can make alliances. But one of the things that I think has been very good about TUS is the fact that when people stand, there are key principles on which they have to stand on. Both Glyn and I, when we stood for the parliamentary selection, had to sign a pledge to say what were the things, the core things that we would stand on. And one of the core things, I think, is that pledge about cuts, that we would not vote for cuts, that we would not implement cuts. And I think that's still a pledge that anyone that we want to support or any candidate that we want to put forward needs to make exactly that same pledge at this. I think it's a principle that we need to hold people to. Otherwise, we're not creating a movement, we're creating a loose alliance, and it will become frayed at the edges. So I do think it's very important that in the mayoral election, we look to see 
how far people are going to go to support the Tusk, Tusk pledges for the council candidates. Tusk is standing nationally in the council elections that are taking place. Everyone that stands for a council seat for Tusk has had to sign a 10 point pledge to say what they would do if they got um, if they got into the council chamber. One of the key ones is not to vote for and not to implement cuts to the council budget. And I'll, I'll leave you with this because we've seen the Tories, in effect, put in place their people to run Tower Hamlet's council. And yes, they put those people in place. Um, Ostensibly, they're saying to run the council until the new elections end, but actually, they've not put people in place for that. They put them in on an open-ended, um, an open-ended period. That's what the Tories have done. And I think that the thing about Tusk standing in this election is that we are drawing a line. I think everybody knows about the anti-austerity agenda now at Tusk, and we're drawing a line. And the battle lines are drawn. And what's going to happen? after Thursday is crucial. What's going to happen after Thursday? And actually, even for the mayoral election, what will happen after the mayoral election? I think that it's unlikely that the commissioners will leave Tower Hamlet's council if Rabina wins that election. So why, instead of just standing for, um, you know, against democracy, I think, uh, yeah, sorry, for democracy, <laughs> rewind that tape, instead of just standing for democracy, but it's going to be absolutely critical that any candidate that stands in that next election also stands against austerity and makes a clear stand against cuts. To my mind, instead of fighting, behind, fighting with one hand behind your back, you need to come out with both hands with the boxing gloves on. And so I think that there needs to be continued discussion, in my view, with in Tusk and with ever, whoever else who wants to stand about how we fight that mayoral, mayoral election with both hands in front of us, one punching for democracy, the other punching against austerity and against the cuts. Thanks. Uh, got any more questions? I had a reflection as a Green Party member from my sins. Uh, I found their approach to the coup quite disgraceful and um, pretty much a whitewash. They're going to stand candidates, even though they don't believe in elected mayors. Uh, I know there's been some discussion, but acceptability politics seems to have taken hold of them. Um, what interactions have you had uh, with that camp locally? Well, I mean, you know, I, I certainly don't see the Green Party as, as the enemy. Um, and obviously, the, a number of things that myself and others from my tradition, my background, would would agree with them on. But I think in my own experience is kind of a reflection of where I feel that, that there is a problem and uh, that that leads me to conclude that the Green Party is not the answer. Um, I mean, I have been involved in some discussions with the Greens. I, can't, I think it was over a year ago now. I can't remember exactly in preparation for what, but anyway, you know, with a view to seeing is there not some possibility for some kind of alliance or bit locally, whereby we on the left or the Reds, if you wish, do not compete with the Greens, um, and I and I still think that that is a, an eminently sensible political <coughs> direction to go in, but I, you know, it, it bore no fruit. Um, the Green Party locally certainly, and, um, and as I understand it, nationally as well, at the moment, appear very resistant to forming any kind of broader alliance beyond its own, beyond its own borders, and, and I think that's a problem. And the other reason why, 
from my own perspective, I would say that the, the Green Party are not the answer, and where, you know, I think they're, I mean, I, I don't make predictions about elections because they're almost always wrong, but, um, you know, I don't think they connect with a large swathe of the borough, and that's because they don't get sufficiently involved in the kinds of campaigns that people in this room have been involved with for many years, <coughs> they don't do it consistently. So we see them dip in and out of, uh, for instance, the anti-bedroom tax campaign. We see them dip in and out of campaigns around housing, but there is no, there is no consistency in it. And, and I, I hesitate to say that, but I think to a large extent that is reflected at a national level as well. Um, and so, you know, I have, I, you know, I'm on friendly terms with some of the Green Party activists in town, and, you know, would be more than happy to to have those kinds of discussions with them. But my sense of it is that, that they're really not interested in building anything bigger. And, and, and so although I certainly feel that that door should remain open locally and, and beyond, you know, my sense of it is that, in a way, it's a, bit of, it's a one way traffic, really. And, uh, but I mean, others may have had other experiences, but that's certainly been mine. And, I, and also, I have to say, uh, you know, I, I kind of sympathise with you and what you've said tonight, having to do it on Facebook, which didn't make it up, um, about the Greens policy announcement yesterday. Um, you know, I think they fudge some of the crucial issues. I think this is, uh, I like that term, acceptability politics. And, you know, we're in a harder time now, and, and we, we need to be harder on some of these core issues of, you know, talking in an undifferentiated way as that as the Greens have wanted to do on certain issues, and housing being the one that bothers me the most. They still do tend to lapse into social housing, into affordable housing, that kind of language, which has become an instrument of confusion and, and illusion, really. So, you know, Let's, let's see, but my experience, I have to say, generally speaking, has not been a particularly optimistic one when it comes to the Green Party, but who knows? Thanks. Uh, any other questions? I was just wondering what, what Charlie and Hugo are suggesting we could do after the, uh, after the general election. Thing. I mean, we had that meeting the other Thursday that was absolutely brilliant, and it was a shot in the arm, I think. Uh, I don't know how many was there. There must have been 3,000 people. Now, that is actually enough to, well, maybe have a little protest uh, somewhere. You know, did you, did you see what I mean? The, the, the people there, did, what's stopping us uh, having a little protest? I mean, obviously, I'm conscious of all here, so he knows what's going on, as it were internally within Towns First. I think it's a lot easier for us, as it were, sitting here than it is than it is for to look for the people around him. You know, I think we need to remember that. But having said that, you know, I do feel that overall Town is first has, has been too timid. And I think that it has not adopted as as a as an aggressive or as an assertive a, a, a political approach throughout its period, um, in, you know, in general in relation to a number of issues, not least the cuts, but you know, housing and other things. But I think you're right. I think, given what happened the other Thursday, I think now is the time. To, we had that was a brilliant start last last week, but it's very easy for that kind of momentum to be lost. And it happened in November, if people remember, we had a very similar demonstration, a very similar event here, which I also spoke at. Huge numbers, lots of energy, lots of anger, lots of enthusiasm, let's do something. And a lot of that was allowed to dissipate and drain away. And I think it's imperative that we don't allow that to happen again. I think uh, that, that's definitely true. Uh, everything is not perfect with um, this first. Um, do you have a question? Um, you, uh, uh, I've just got a comment on the last two points. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, I'm not a detailed observer of the politics that happened in the uh, uh, nationalism. Uh, what I found 
the, uh, the excessive rents, but it would at least be a, a beginning along that route. And I think you're asking the, the, the key question, how do we influence that process? What forums are there? What is the vision for the town first? Because I agree, you know, if this is all about, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, uh, it, but if this becomes about another cult of personality, it's not going to work. Yeah. All right. So, but I guess that in the end, the responsibility is ours, I suppose, and I don't think you know we can't abdicate that responsibility. Um, but I think you're you're on the money, if I may say so. Um, I think partly where we, well, if we want to make change happen, then I think we need to stop thinking that it happens from above and actually we need to build, if you think of all the things that we have changed, including the policy about the bedroom tax and not evicting people who are affected by it, that was because there was campaigning. So, I just wanted to suggest that one of the things, we do, one of the proposals that came up was that there should be a protest march about Bishopsgate Goods Yard to say we need public housing for people in town and it's built on that site, we don't need more city on the And I would suggest that between councillors and candidates and everybody, that we agree now that we will do that at some point before the 11th of June and start building the voice that says this is what people of Tahamilton are together and we, if we can model that from, you know, from the street upwards then we will create the politics that we need and it seems to me that's there's nobody putting people on a up on a plinth and then saying why haven't we done it you know we have to stop thinking about it like that we have to create the movement like we did in the anti-war movement that can shift the politics and it seems to me let's start with Thursday or the build up to Thursday because one of the things I want to say sorry I'm drifting a little bit off this now but I think we know there's a lot of common purpose but the danger is that we still function a bit separately and actually I you know we've been talking today about having a car cavalcade and going around the market and things like that that needs to not only be made more people or only white right people. This is a ridiculous way for us to do our politics and we need to, if people here tonight can help us make sure that over the next three days that isn't so, um, then we can have a more interesting <coughs> impact. Because I, a lot of what I'm finding in the mind is that people are angry, people understand a lot of what we're talking about, but what they don't have is hope and confidence yeah. that we can get our act together and present coherent alternative, so I think that's our job really, and if anybody can help. I think the image of the Stockholm Coalition and the human interfacing is a, is a really good one, and I really hope this Bishopsgate could you have the public land. That kind of activity starts immediately following the election, before the deadline for registration. Uh, I arrived too late on Thursday, I saw some of the videos on on YouTube after trying to pick a, um, a stable web resource for resources on Tower Hamlet's coup. Um, did you have anything to say about this um, bishop's game? Well, I mean, there's been a campaign around it for some time, but it hasn't really punched home. I mean, I was involved in it years ago. Um, it's tended to articulate some slightly esoteric demands around preservation and light and things like that. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't important, they are to a degree, but they're not going to connect with, um, with the vast majority of people in the borough. And so, you know, Bishopsgate Goodyard is perhaps a good example and a good opportunity for us to mainstream some of these demands, you know, ultimately the planning approval for that dis for that redevelopment, well it's shared actually because Hackney County, the, the site straddles, certainly uh, Hackney, I think it's just Hackney, 
straddles Hackney uh, Council. Though I believe the Mayor of Hackney has, has taken a fairly robust position on this. I'm not sure about that. Um, but ultimately, you know, the committee, the planning committee of Tower Hamlet Council will have to take a view on the planning application of Bishop's Gate Goods Yard. Now, in all likelihood, if they said, well, no, this is not good enough for our borough, the Mayor of London would step in and dictate again to our local elected representatives. But I think, I think we should give him that opportunity, actually, because, you know, the planning committee of the council are not going to vote down the redevelopment plans for Bishopsgate Goods Yard unless we put sufficient pressure on them to do it. You know, it is, I think I heard Ivan say this, it is about a movement from below. Uh, because, you know, it's very easy for councillors and particularly for planners who influence that whole process to take the line of least resistance. To worry about appeals, to worry about oh, Boris job. It's far easier for them to just roll over, go for the usual stuff, which is the kind of crumbs from the table of the, of the development proposal. And again, I have to say, this is down to us. You know, we are the ones who can influence and change that decision. But, you know, as with anything related to planning, uh, time is of the essence. Once a development process and the planning process, once that machinery starts to roll, it's incredibly difficult to stop. You find yourself tied up in all kinds of legalistic knots. We don't want to go there. It doesn't work ultimately. That's what I think the Bishopsgate Goods Yard campaigners have, have been trying to do, and it's, it's, not going to, it's not going to succeed. We need thousands of people to get involved in a campaign saying very simply, this is our home. You know, this isn't just some development opportunity. This is not where you're going to extend, which is what they want. They want to extend the City of London into Tower Hamlet. They want to extend the borders of the corporate financial domain over Bishopsgate into our borough. And we have to be prepared to say, no, we're not going to do that because you're not providing things that, that we need. So we need a campaign around it, and it, and it needs to be a big one, uh, because it's a big development site. And we have to pick one of these. You know, we've had little forays into this uh, area in the past, but and, you know, Oli quite rightly reminded us, actually reminded us importantly, that these kinds of initiatives can be stopped in their tracks because we stopped stop, stop transfer on the Ocean Estate. We stopped stock transfer on other estates in the borough. Um, and in a way, Bishop's Gate Goods Yard is, is, a, is a better opportunity for galvanising the community because it, there isn't an existing community there. It's a derelict site. You know, obviously with stock transfer, it's very easy for the developers and housing associations to kind of appeal to people's narrow, and, and you might say, self-interest. Uh, but that's not the case of Bishop's Gate Goods Yard. <coughs> It's a virgin site, it's a place that has immense possibility. And I, so I'm going to show my age now, I remember when the dots closed in the early 80s, my family were all involved in the, in the, uh, in the waterfront industries. And when the dots closed, along with many others, that infected us, uh, our family and, and, and our livelihoods. But at that time, uh, local trade unions in the Labour Party and other voluntary organisations and community groups got together and they wrote a thing called the People's Plan for the Docks. And what they said was that these thousands of, of acres of land, hundreds of acres, actually, sorry, hundreds, hundreds of acres of land that used to be the docks, which are technically publicly owned, could provide us with hundreds of the homes we need, could provide us with hundreds of the jobs that we need. And I would say exactly the same <coughs> pertains at Bishop's Gate, good to you, but we haven't got long. If we don't get something like this going very, very quickly, and I mean, you know, maybe using Rabina's campaign as a launch pad for this, then it will be too late. And, you know, we've seen what happens. We've seen what happens at Canary Wharf. You know, a cordon sanitaire, a place where we can't demonstrate, a place where people mostly can't afford to go to buy things. People excluded from that area. Exactly the same will happen at Bishopsgate Goods Yard unless we fight to stop them. That's a good point maybe to end on because it's uh
Margaret. I wanted a final question, and it came up in that penultimate response on the floor. Um, the look for a continuity candidate was pretty much decided without anyone else's involvement. I'm sure there's lots of amazing people who could sit and talk it over, at least have, so that people have a shared understanding of what's been done. I know it's difficult to talk about it now that it's been announced because uh, especially the Bengali community would get um, accused of splitting the vote or working for for neighbour. Um, and we've had some conversations about a Maulana Bashani, that kind of totemic figure that kind of has left credential and Muslim credential. And none of that seems to really be in the creative mix for what I call the decolonial option for Without um, Hamlet, um, how open are you to like creative solutions to to that And do you, do you think that door is closed? I'm not absolutely sure what you're implying, though. If I do have other plans after the seventh uh, of May, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, town is first. Like, you know, I'm not completely familiar with its internal workings. I've never been part of it. I don't know how it makes its decisions. I think the criticisms that yourself and, and, and you have made are very valid ones, actually. Um, I guess it's now, you know, the die is cast. And, and I think that, and, well, no, to be perfectly honest, I think at this point it would be a tactical error to, to alter the decision that's been made. And I think we all need to throw ourselves behind getting Rabina elected. I think it's, that is the bigger picture. You know, well, I think to test that theory, you only have to consider the alternative, which is basically that John Biggs you know, yeah. And I mean, once you reflect on that, you know, it becomes a bit of a no-brainer. But I think, I think longer term, you're absolutely right. You know, and I've had the, the pleasure of meeting some of the people in town this first and getting to know them over the last few weeks in a way that I haven't before. And I know that there are people who are have been in line with Towns First, Ollie obviously being one example, but there are others who I think do have that wider vision, who I think are up for a discussion about how we might harness that energy that was in this place last Thursday and how we might turn into the kinds of issues like Bishop Scapegoat's Yard and other things in the future. But, you know, right now we need to get the best possible vote on Thursday because I've never been in any doubt whatsoever that, you know, that Getting the maximum vote for, for left unity and task for myself and Hugo is the best guarantee that, that Rabina wins on June the 11th. Because once people get back into the habit of voting New Labour, that's going to be a very difficult thing to turn around. So I understand the points and I think the criticisms are valid ones. But I think we, we, right now we don't have the luxury. We need to make sure that Rabina gets elected. But not unconditionally and not about criticism. No politician should ever be in that position anyway and how we talk about the structures, the decision making and so forth, we need to do that. But right now, let's do everything we can between now and Thursday and then beyond. But then let's not leave the room, as it were, neither figuratively or literally. That, that's, this has been, a, I know people need to get up and pray, this has been a really interesting and positive discussion, I think, and of the kind that we need to have more of. So thank you for, for organising this. Thank you for your time.